So we're starting with our familiar diagram again, a, an affordable set designated by the budget constraint BC1, an initial consumption point A, and I'm going to study a fall in the price of X as I've been doing usually. That generates an increase in the affordable set, an expansion of the affordable set in the X direction. Let's suppose that that's a fairly substantial increase. So the new budget constraint is BC2. You can see that the affordable set has expanded quite a bit. It expands in the X direction. The new consumption point would be a point like this, call it point C. If we have a new indifference curve, I'll call the original indifference curve U0. Uh, actually, I probably should have called it U1 because I called the budget constraint BC1. I, I don't have to. I, could have called it U0, but U1 is a little bit more consistent. The question I want to address here is one that on first glance seems to have no answer, which is whether X and Y are normal or inferior. Now you'll recall that normal and inferior have to do with income changes. There is no income change here. Income changes in this kind of diagram are illustrated by parallel shifts in the budget constraint. We don't have a parallel shift in the budget constraint anywhere. We have a twist of the budget constraint. So it would seem like the question whether X or Y are normal or inferior goods is impossible to answer because there's no parallel shift in the budget constraint. But economists are kind of clever and have figured out a technique for squeezing out of this diagram answers to the question of is X a normal or inferior good and is Y a normal or inferior good, even though there's no income change. Intuitively, the reason is because, the reason this is possible is because a decrease in the price of X kind of makes you feel richer. Your affordable set has gone up and you know, when your income changes, your affordable set goes up. Now, your affordable set hasn't gone up in the same way as it would have if your income had really changed. If your income had really changed, the affordable set would go out in a way that corresponds to a parallel shift in the budget constraint, and there is no parallel shift here. But this flavor of the decrease in price, which is that it kind of makes you feel richer, is what going is going to make this following technique possible. The idea is to draw what I call an imaginary budget constraint. And the imaginary budget constraint say BCI where the I stands for imaginary is drawn in the following way. It's parallel to the new budget constraint and it's tangent to the original indifference curve. Let me repeat that because it's a little complicated. So parallel to the new budget constraint which in this case is BC2, and tangent to the original indifference curve, which is the one I marked U1. Now, I can't really explain why we draw the imaginary budget constraint with these two criteria right now, but you'll see how it works very shortly. So let me do that, and I'm going to try to be precise in my my graphing. So it's going to take me a while. I'll uh, pause the recording while I draw this new budget constraint parallel to BC2 
and tangent to u1. So now I've drawn this imaginary budget constraint, BCI. I'll mark its endpoints here and here so it's easier for you to see. Let's verify that it satisfies the two criteria that it's supposed to satisfy. The first criterion is, is that it's supposed to be parallel to the new budget constraint. I think you can see that the line that's joined by the two red dots is parallel to BC2. Second, it's supposed to be tangent to the original indifference curve. I think you can see that the line drawn by the two red dots is tangent to U1, which is the original indifference curve. We'll mark this point B, which is the point of tangency. Now the consumer doesn't know anything about point B, doesn't know anything about the imaginary budget constraint, just goes from point A to point C, end of story. But the economist, if he knows where the consumer's indifference curves are, and we're assuming that, can construct point B using the imaginary budget constraint. And this is extremely useful because we wanted to ask the question whether these goods were normal or inferior. And the problem we had was we didn't have a parallel shift in anything. Well, now we do have a parallel shift in something. We've got a pair of parallel lines, BCI and BC2. They're parallel to each other. And since they're parallel to each other, moving from BCI to BC2 is just like getting an increase in income. We use this information, the information that when you move from B, point B to point C, it's like an increase in income, to answer the question about being normal or inferior. In particular, when you compare B versus C, because C lies to the right of B, it's an increase in X. Because C lies above B, it's an increase in y. And because BC2 is farther out than BCI, it's like an increase in income. Now, we know income actually hasn't increased. The only thing that's happened in this diagram is that the price of x has fallen. Income hasn't done anything at all. But the motion from the imaginary budget constraint BCI and point B, which is point B's imaginary too, uh, in the sense that cons consumer never goes to it, to BC2, the new budget constraint, is what would happen if there had been an increase in income. So if there had been an increase in income, you would have gone. This guy would have gone from B to C. X would have increased. Y would have increased. And because this is like an increase in income, we could have concluded from that that X was normal and Y was normal. Because you'll recall that the definition of a normal good is that when income increases, you buy more of it. The motion from B to C is called the income effect of a price change. Sometimes we abbreviate it the income effect, but that abbreviation can be confusing. Whenever we say the abbreviation the income effect, what we mean is the income effect of a price change. Income hasn't really changed, but there's some aspect of the price change that resembles an income change. And the motion from B to C captures that. And it enables us to get information about whether X is normal or inferior and whether Y is normal or inferior. The, the, the actual change of the consumer is just A to C. So you can think about breaking A to C up into two parts. The second part is the motion from B to C. The first part would be the motion from A to B, which we haven't talked about yet. The motion from A to B has a name. It's called the substitution effect of a price change. Oops.
Now, this is a little hard to talk about because the consumer never goes to point B. He starts at A, he goes to C, he doesn't know anything about B. But the way to understand this is one of the things that a price change does is it twists the budget constraint. And the other thing it does is if it's a price decrease, it makes you feel richer. The feel richer part was captured in the income effect, the B to C part. The twisting of the budget constraint part is what the motion from A to B captures. Because look at what happens from A to B. At A, the consumer is looking at a budget constraint like this. At B, the consumer is looking at a budget constraint like this. That has r that really twisted. There isn't any further twisting. When you go from B to C, there's no twisting. So the motion from A to B represents the twisting of the budget constraint. And you can see the direction that it goes in. We have a decrease in the price of X and the twisting of the budget constraint because the because the indifference curve is has the usual kind of shape you have the twisting of the budget constraint from this angle to that angle that is always going to go to the right and down to the right means more x down means less y so the substitution effect of a, of a fall in the price of x always takes you to more x and less y. It, you keep the indifference curve the same and you twist along the indifference curve to take you from A to B. So we started out w with a general change, which is the change from A to C. We break that up into two parts, a change from A to B and a change from B to C. A to B is the substitution effect of the price change. B to C is the income effect of the price change. Having done that, we can utilize the second part, the income effect, the B to C part, to get information about whether X and Y are normal or, or inferior goods.